Hi Grade 9, so we are finally, finally, finally at the first stage of our revision series and we're going to be starting off the series by looking at the digestive system. We will do circulatory in the second video, respiratory in the third video. We will link musculoskeletal and excretory and nervous system together in the fourth video and in the final last video we will do reproductive system. So to go all the way back to term 1, we looked at cells and we looked at the function and the structures of cells and we saw that cells in an animal they will normally have a nucleus they will have cytoplasm they'll probably have a vacuole they will have a cell membrane surrounding the cell and they will have mitochondria within them and remember we learned mitochondria is the place where cellular respiration occurs that is going to be very important and links up to every section okay now when we have cells we know that different types of cells have got different structures and different functions for example if we look at epithelial cells which we find in our skin these are more elongated they are quite stretchy and they also perform uh, the task of protecting the skin or the organism we have muscle cells which are more spindle shaped which obviously allows for the contraction and expansion of the muscles and this helps obviously to bring about movement so what we call it when we have all these similar cells working together is we have tissue. So we'll either have cardiac tissue or we'll have epithelial tissue or we'll have uh, muscular tissue or muscle tissue. And all these cells in this tissue, they will all look the same. They'll perform the same function. They will all work together to bring about one task or to come to make sure that one certain type of task is completed. Now, when we have a group of different tissue working together to perform a task, this is what we call an organ. So, for example, if we look at the heart, the heart is an organ. The heart consists of blood vessels, it consists of muscles, it consists of valves, and all of these tissues have different types of textures. And you guys will even remember from the, if you had a look at the kidney, how the kidney is one organ but we felt how different each of the little aspects of the kidney felt. Of We felt how hard the pelvis was, how soft and squishy the little pyramids inside the kidneys were. Um, we felt how smooth the outside of the kidney was, that renal membrane. So we have all these different tissues, but they work together to bring about one task. Okay. Now, when we have a whole bunch of these different organs working together to complete a special task or something within the body, we call this a system. So if we look at the example in the book, they talk about hearts. So they talk about heart, blood, blood vessels all working together to complete the circulatory system and to deliver oxygen to the body and to remove carbon dioxide from the body. And when we have tons of these systems all working together, we then have what we call an organism. So if we just go through the flow charts, a cell, when we have lots of similar cells together, we have tissue. When we've got lots of different tissues working together, we have an organ. When we have different organs working together, we have a system. And when we have all our systems working together properly, we have a healthy organism, like this lady who looks like she's going to the beach. And as we see, as the flow charts increases, it becomes more complex. So the cells being the building blocks are very, very simple. We know the components of them. We know how they function. We can see them as little individual um, aspects of the body. And the further on it gets, the more complicated it gets. Okay. And then we also spoke about stem cells, which are obviously have the, um, the ability to develop into very, very different types of specialized cells. So stem cells are basically unspecialized at the particular points. And they can be found very early in embryonic development. Um, we also see that adult bone marrow contains these stem cells. Okay, so moving on to the very first system that we'll be looking at is the digestive system. And the most important part to remember about the digestive system is that it contains four main stages. These are ingestion, digestion, absorption, and egestion. Okay. Digestion, the second stage, has got two types of digestion that we recognize, which is mechanical and chemical. So if we look at the digestive system, it says that the digestive system or the purpose of the digestive system is to take in external substances, such as food in our case, and break these foods down into smaller particles that we know as molecules, so that it is easier for these little molecules to be absorbed by the bloodstream and transported throughout the body so that the body can use this in cellular respiration to produce energy so that the different tissues, the different muscles, the different functions, all the different organs in your body can function appropriately. Okay, so... The importance of food is that it provides the body with energy, it supplies the body with materials for growth, it has nutrients that help to repair and replace damaged tissue, and it helps to protect the body from diseases and, and infections. So it basically gives us the fuel to keep growing, to keep fighting, to keep growing, to keep moving, and to keep working in the way that we're supposed to work. The digestive system consists of the alimentary canal and associated organs. So the alimentary canal is the longest tube, and it goes basically from your opening your mouth all the way down through the rectum and out the anus. So from the mouth all the way down to the anus is known as your alimentary canal. 
And obviously we know along that we've got the mouth cavity, the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and as I've mentioned, the rectum and the anus. Now, in order for all these things to all work properly together, we need to have things that we call associated organs. And what these associated organs do is they help assist the digestive process. So without them, the digestive system would not work properly or as efficiently as or as efficiently as it does. Okay, so these associated organs are the teeth, the tongue, the liver, and the pancreas. So going through those four main steps now, we talk about ingestion, which is the process of taking food in via the mouth, digestion, which is consisting of mechanical digestion, which is when we physically break down food via our teeth and the muscles of our stomach walls. So our stomach walls actually move so that this food is able to be broken down further, so that it mixes with the hydrochloric acid, the teeth grind down the food, the tongue mixes it up and squishes, up, squishes it up against your palates and mixes it in with your saliva. So all these physical movements are known as mechanical digestion. Chemical digestion, on the other hand, is when we use enzymes or other substances, chemical substances, to break down food. So, for example, in the stomach, we use hydrochloric acid to break down our food. We have enzymes in our saliva, which help to break down the food as well. So it, what it is doing is that it is chemically dissolving this food, breaking it down into these small molecules so that our bodies can use the food. Then we have absorption, which takes place in the large and small intestine, um, but more particularly in the small intestine. And the large intestine is just for the very, very final last stages. So when we ask where absorption takes place, if you just focus on the small intestine, that is absolutely perfect at this stage of your education. So absorption is defined as the movement of dissolved nutrients from the small intestine into the bloodstream, as we can see by this lovely little picture here. Egestion is then the final removal of the undigested food and waste products from the body via the anus. This is also known as um, defecation. All right. Now, if we have a closer look at our little diagram here, we can see the mouth cavity. And if we just follow the process, we see how the food gets chewed up, mixed with saliva. The tongue breaks down the food, the teeth break down the food here in the mouth cavity. And the tongue will assist in swallowing the food by pushing the food down the back of the throat. So as the food moves down the alimentary canal, this first stage that we know as our food pipe, this is the esophagus. All right. Now, the esophagus is a long tube that connects the mouth to the stomach, and it is very muscular. And what these muscles in the esophagus do is they work together to squeeze and contract so that they kind of squish the food down towards the stomach. Okay. It's very important to notice that unlike the... Um, respiratory system, there are no cartagenous rings in the esophagus. Okay, So once the food has moved down the esophagus, it travels into the stomach, which is a very muscular sac-like organ. And this is where we have our ton of enzymes, tons of hydrochloric acid, which break down the food. And this partially digested, partially broken down food substance is what we call charm or calm. All right. And what then happens is this partially undigested substance moves down out the stomach and into the small intestine. And this is where absorption now takes place. However, along the way, we have the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas, which all add bits and pieces into the stomach to help the ease, for more easy absorption of the food and for more easy digestion of this food. So if we have a look at the liver, the liver secretes bile, which then moves to be stored in this tiny gallbladder. So the function of the gallbladder is to store bile. And what this bile does is it helps to assist the digestion of fats in the small intestine. The pancreas, is a tongue-shaped structure that sits underneath the stomach. Some people describe it to be tongue-shaped, some people describe it to be finger-shaped, some people describe it to be leaf-shaped. All you need to know is that it's kind of a long, elongated, slightly triangular shape. It lies beneath the stomach, and this assists the digestive system by secreting digestive juices into the small intestine, which continues this digestion of this charm that we're speaking about here. So the charm moves into the small intestine, and this is where the most of the are absorption process occurs. So the digestive juices secreted by the walls of the stomach digest this charm into molecules which are then absorbed into the blood which we can then transport to the rest of our body and use in our cellular respiration um, equation to produce energy. We then have the large intestine, which is a very muscular tube. Now, even though this is called the large intestine, it's much shorter. And the reason we call it the large intestine is because it's much wider. So the small intestine is very, very long, but the tubes as such are very skinny, very small. The large intestine has got very, very wide tube, uh, very, very wide tubing. So the large intestine is a mu muscular tube that extends from the small intestine. So the small intestine moves into the large intestine here, and it serves as a temporary storage place for the undigested waste material, which is known as feces. And when the body is ready to release this feces, this large intestine squishes itself along, just like the esophagus did, by squeezing one end, relaxing, squeezing, relaxing. So you're squishing it all the way across. And when you do it, finally gets stored in the rectum. The feces gets stored in the rectum. And when the human is ready to defecate or ready to um, excrete this waste, he 
then allows his anus to relax, which allows the waste products to leave the body. Now, in order for all this to happen, we need to make sure that we are following a proper balanced diet. Otherwise, all these purposes here, all this providing energy and supplying materials for growth and all these things that we spoke about would not be able to happen if we didn't have a proper balanced diet. Because every little part of our diet um, contributes to another specific part of our body and helps with specific functions. So we need to have sufficient amounts of every food group. And the following represents the essential food groups required by the body. So we speak about carbohydrates, we speak about proteins, fats and oils, fibers and vitamins and minerals. Now, before we go on to that in more depth, we just need to make sure that we know about the importance of water. And water knows, or we should know from class, that water makes up 70% of the human body. And most of that water is stored in the cytoplasm of our cells. However, this water needs to be cleaned, it needs to be regulated. We use water to flush out our system. It's vital in the... Um, in the excretory system and of course we produce water during cellular respiration it's one of the it is one of the byproducts that we produce along with carbon dioxide so we need to be able to get good clean water in and get rid of the water that we don't need anymore so if we have a look here water makes up 70 percent of our body mass it's taken in when foods and fluids are consumed and it plays an important role in that it provides a medium for chemical reactions so it's much easier for chemical reactions to occur when it is in a a liquid situation or a liquid substance um, and this just really makes everything much easier for the the chemical reactions to take place it also removes waste products from the body via urine and sweats as we know from the excretory system it is a major component of blood okay it forms part of the plasma which we have learned about which transports the dissolved substances around the body dissolved substances we know to be either nutrition or to be oxygen or carbon dioxide waste products all that sort of thing salts and also it provides a very important role of cooling the body via sweat Okay, now when we look at the different types of food groups, if we look at carbohydrates, the importance of carbohydrates is to provide the body with energy over a long period of time. So carbohydrates are our slow release energy substances that we need to consume. They're the main source of energy. So starches tend to be the more slow release, whereas sugars tend to be, such as glucose, tend to be quicker releases, but still much slower than fats and oils. Okay. Breads, rice, maize, and chocolates are all sources of carbohydrates. Obviously, we can see, we know which ones are going to be healthier and which ones are going to be less healthy for us, which are the pure forms of starch that contain more natural products and which ones contain a lot of synthetic ingredients, which our body does not necessarily need and will need to work extra hard to get rid of. We then move on to proteins. These are things such as fish and meats and eggs and beans. And what's interesting is that the cells in our own bodies are mostly made up of proteins. And we know that when bodybuilders are trying to work out or people are trying to gain muscle mass they need to consume a lot of protein and what this protein is responsible for is the repair and the growth of new cells so obviously when we are growing when we're going through our growth spurts when we are trying to build muscle and get fit we need to provide our body with the ingredients to be able to produce more muscle and to repair any broken tissue or broken cells so the body needs this protein to make new cells during growth and to replace the worn out and damaged cells so protein is very important for growth and repair we then speak about fats and oils. So fats come from animals and oils come from fish and plants. And these are a very, very rich source of energy. And what that means is that we get a lot of energy in a very, very small amount. Whereas with carbohydrates, we need to consume a lot more of it in order to get, a, get the, the same amount of energy. Okay, so body stores this fat, um, these fats as fats in our body, as reserve energy. So we have this extra fat in our body when we're not burning our energy or fast enough. So fat is stored underneath the skin, it's stored around the heart and the kidneys. Now it's important to remember that the texture of fat is not the same all over the body. And for those of you who felt the fat that surrounded the kidneys, you felt it was a lot harder than the fat that we're used to seeing on, for example, a piece of bacon. Okay. Fat under the skin, it acts as an insulator and it re reduces heat loss from the skin, so it keeps us warm. Cheese, chips and nuts are rich in fat. Then we have fiber. Now... Our bodies cannot actually digest fiber. By that we mean we cannot actually break it down to absorb it properly. We do not have the capacity or the capabilities of animals such as cows and horses, whose entire diet consists basically of the fiber and the nutrients that they get from plants. So for us, we need this fiber to help with the digestive system. So fiber, which is also known as roughage, often comes from or only comes from plant materials. Foods that are high in fiber include bran cereals, sweet corn, celery, and cannot be digested, but it's very important for our diet as it prevents constipation. It helps to absorb poisonous substances from the digestive system, so it acts as a broom, it acts as a sweep, it cleans you out of all the bad stuff inside you, 
and it really reduces the risk of heart disease. Okay, and what it does, it, it does this by decreasing cholesterol in the body. Vitamins and minerals are our final food group that we're going to be looking at, and these are obviously needed in very small quantities, but they are highly essential for our good health. So we have a lot of diseases, a lot of deficiencies that are we experience when we do not receive enough vitamins or minerals. So for example, anemia, which we have all heard of before because we've spoken about it in class, is caused by a lack of iron in the blood. Vitamin C is essential for preventing colds and flu. Calcium is essential for the development and maintenance of healthy teeth and bones. So when you're growing, you must drink lots of milk. Okay, um, And fruits, vegetables, and cereals are a rich source of vitamins and minerals, but we do find vitamins and minerals in other food groups as well. Okay, So it's not exclusive. It's not just because it belongs to one group, it doesn't belong to the other. We can get calcium from milks and cheeses, but milks and cheeses also fall under fats and oils. So it's important to remember that as well. All right, we now finish off the section by looking, as we always do, at the problems associated with the particular system we are looking at. Okay, now, one of the main issues that we have in South Africa in particular, but in the entire world, is malnutrition. And malnutrition occurs when the person is not receiving the right amount of nutrients, the right amount of food groups, too much or too little of a certain type of food, and it causes the body to stop working in the best possible way. So the four examples that we looked at, um, that we experienced a lot in South Africa, are kwashioko, marasmus, anorexia, and obesity. So we start by looking at kwashioko, and kwashioko is caused by having too little protein in the diet. So when the child is busy growing up, he is not getting enough protein, he's not getting enough meats or milks or cheeses in his body, um, or, or any of these other things that we look at here, eggs and beans and all that sort of thing, because it's important to remember that not all proteins come from meat products. Even though majority do, we can get a, we can live a perfectly healthy, balanced diet um, on vegetarian proteins or proteins from vegetables. Okay. Um, and so when a child is not receiving enough of these proteins, they end up leaving with a bloated stomach. But you'll see that the rest of them, uh, the rest of their body is highly undeveloped. So they will have very skinny arms, very skinny legs, and their tummy will be disproportionately bloated. So you can quite easily see that it's not depositions of fat. The child is not fat. You can see clearly that he's very skinny and malnourished, but he has this very distinct bloated stomach. Marismus is the next one we look at, and this is the most common form of malnutrition caused by too little food. So what happens is in very, very poor communities in these environments where we do not have access to the resources that mm, more fortunate people have, people are not able to feed their babies. And when they are not able to feed their babies, either because they are not able to feed themselves, so that they cannot produce enough breast milk correctly, they cannot afford formula, they cannot afford um, supplements for the child, the child will, the child's body will default to doing absolutely anything it can to survive. And what it will do as it then consumes its own body tissue in order to get that energy that it needs. So in order for cellular respiration to carry on, it uses the energy, it takes the, it takes the, the substances from the cells and uses that to convert it into energy. So um, you can clearly see that it has a big lack of muscle tissue. So the child will be very, very weak. You'll have literally no muscles um, to work with. Okay, the next one we look at is anorexia, and this is a psychological condition, and this is where a person refuses to eat or does not eat enough calories in a day in order to maintain metabolism. Now, metabolism is the functioning of the human body, so the person does not consume enough to do all the daily processes it needs to do, such as fuel digestion, fuel the respiratory system, fuel the excretory system, and when this happens, very similar to marasmus, is the body loses mass a lot, and it starts using its own resources it uses up the last bits of muscle it has, it uses up the last bits of fat it has, so that it can try and continue to function as it should. And the last one we'll be looking at is obesity. And obesity is when we eat too much energy-rich food. So we're eating too much of these fats and oils. Remember I said fats and oils, they provide us with a large amount of energy and a very, very small amount of intake. And what this results, is, results in is increased body mass, which means that the person gains a lot more fat. Um, they have really, really high fat deposits, and so their bodies become much larger. Um, and it also results in high blood pressure and heart disease, and we'll be looking at that in more detail in the circulatory system. Other health, health issues that are related to the actual organs within the digestive system, we're going to be looking at ulcers, diarrhea, and psoriasis of the liver. So ulcers are little sores that present themselves in the stomach when the stomach lining becomes damaged. Now, we spoke about hydrochloric acid being the main component or the main chemical component in the digestive system to allow for foods to be broken down. And so 
the stomach needs a very, very thick lining to protect itself from these digestive juices. Because if we're busy digesting chicken or bacon or meats or steak or whatever we're busy digesting, what's stopping that hydrochloric acid from actually digesting our stomachs themselves? And this is that very, very special, very thick, very hardy lining. Um, so gastric ulcers may be caused by bacteria, which can then be treated by antibiotics. However, psychological stress and excess acid secretion may also cause stomach ulcers. Diarrhea. And this is where, this is a very common thing. Most people would have experienced at least a mild case of um, diarrhea at least once in their lives. And this is where the feces becomes incredibly watery. Now, it's important to remember that the feces that's leaving our body is the waste product, that little bit of undigested fiber that comes from, or the leftovers from that absorption process that takes place in the, in the small intestine. Now, when we have diarrhea, this is very watery. So what this means, and we know that water is a means of producing or, sorry, of transporting different substances and fluids and things like that. And when we have diarrhea, what's happening is all the nutrients and things in our body or in our large intestine and small intestine are being flushed out too early before they've actually had the chance to um, be absorbed properly by the blood. And this causes two main problems. So number one, we're not receiving enough nutrients. And number two, we're losing too much water, which could be used elsewhere, um, resulting in the person being dehydrated. Because obviously we need those water or that water from um, the intake of food. We need it to fill up our cells. We need it to con uh, make the cytoplasm. We need it in our blood. We need it in our excretory system. And when we don't have enough of it, we become dehydrated. So if we are fortunate, fortunate enough to be in a situation where we have access to extra fluids, we have access to electrolytes and things that will help us with the digestive process, we will often survive through our diarrhea phases. However, in Africa, it is a major issue where people do not have the resources to treat diarrhea. They are drinking from water sources which will cause diarrhea um, at a very large scale, which results in people becoming extremely dehydrated, becoming extremely nutrient deficient, vitamin deficient, and what will happen is diarrhea will eventually result in death. So it seems like a concept that we are privileged enough that sounds quite strange to be a cause of death because it's not very common in our um, communities or our schooling. But we need to acknowledge that this is a major issue. And this is something that can be very, very easily treated simply by providing people with clean, pure, healthy water sources. Okay. So diarrhea is the frequent passing of very watery feces, which can lead in to severe dehydration. Other symptoms include fever, vomiting, and stomach cramps. It can be caused by multiple number or numerous things, such as viral or bacterial infections, food poisoning, um, etc. And left untreated, it can lead to death, especially in infants and small children. And why they are so susceptible is obviously because their immune systems are not as built up when they are not as hardy as adults. Adults have a lot more legroom to make mistakes, or they have a lot more legroom to get ill. Children and infants are a lot more vulnerable when they become sick. Okay. And the final thing, psoriasis of the liver. This is the scarring of liver tissue. Now, scar tissue then blocks the normal flow of blood through the liver. We all have a scar somewhere on our bodies, and we know that those scars are of a different texture. They look slightly different to the skin surrounding it. And when we have organs inside our body that are super, super fine-tuned to performing a certain task or a certain function, and, for example, the diffusion of certain substances or the flow of blood over a membrane, um, this is, it's pivotal for these organs to function properly. And when these, when there are problems associated with these, so when these surfaces have got scar tissue or they've got problems associated with them, it stops that normal blood flow from, blood flow from happening. So some of the major causes of psoriasis of the liver include alcoholism, viral infections such as hepatitis B, C and D, and fatty liver diseases caused by obesity and diabetes. And that concludes the digestive system. In our next video, we will be looking at the circulatory system.